Welcome, welcome, welcome to Right Now at the Writers Colony in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, a podcast connecting you to writers of all genres and backgrounds. I'm your host, Julie Rogers, a fellow quill driver here at Writers Colony at Derry Hollow, whose mission is to provide uninterrupted creative time for writers of all genres. Should you choose to make Writers Colony your next writing destination, the property is tucked off the beaten path along Eureka's historic Spring Street and within walking distance to downtown art emporiums, eateries, museums, and more. Three individual living suites at 515 Spring Street, the Langston Hughes, the Mia Angelou, and the Culinary come equipped with private baths, writing nooks, and Wi-Fi. Five additional suites located at 505 Spring provide living quarters, writing rooms, private baths, and a fully equipped kitchen. All food is provided with European-style cuisine dinners prepared by our resident chef in the newly renovated KitchenAid Culinary Suite, which also serves as the perfect space for cookbook writers and culinary bloggers to try out their own recipes. Here you can meet new friends with common interests from across the globe at dinner time in our main dining room. Sequestered, inspirational, and affordable, you're on Eureka time here at the Colony. You can greet every day with your pen in hand, take a stroll in nature through nearby winding trails and bluffs, explore a grotto, head for an espresso downtown, visit our historic Carnaby Library, catch a citywide tram tour, or take one of Eureka's many guided excursions. As a nonprofit supporter of the literary arts, Writers Colony offers subsidized room rates, as well as fellowship and residency application. For more information about your application process, visit our website at writerscolony.org. Which brings us to today's guest and a former Writers Colony resident, Kathy English. Kathy is professor of English at Missouri State University, formerly an English and language arts high school teacher for 21 years in rural Nebraska. Her academic work has been published in Language, Literature, and Interdisciplinary Studies, English Journal, The Rural Educator, The Journal of Literacy Innovation, Elder Mountain, A Journal of Ozark Studies, Syracuse University Press, Rutledge, and IGI Global. So good to have you with us, Kathy. Hi, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Today, we're discussing a memoir you wrote for your best and lifelong friend, Pastor Ruth Yates, titled Dear Ruth, A Book of Grief. During the last 11 months of Ruth's life, you wrote weekly letters that wove daily love, humor, and memories, both extraordinary and quotidian, into the tapestry of Ruth's effort to navigate her own terminal illness. You wrote this during the pandemic, and it highlights a sense of isolation and despair many of us experience when forced to physically separate from ill or dying loved ones. Throughout the book, you share your common love of reading, particularly the works of Kathleen Norris, Mary Oliver, and Emily Dickinson, to name a very few. You mentioned that Ruth was the first person to tell you that you are a good writer, that she encouraged you to heal using the power of the pen after the birth of your stillborn daughter. Writing brought you comprehension of the incomprehensible, you say, and went a long way for abating the subsequent anger you experienced. Eleven days before Ruth died, you received a packet of letters you'd written to her. You had a standing agreement with her husband, Todd, that you would send them back when finished, and he would receive the first autographed copy of your published book. This is how Dear Ruth was born. The fact that reading a book isn't the same process as reading a handwritten letter. You mentioned that you bookmarked this line in your complete works of Emily Dickinson, which reads, A letter is a joy of earth denied the gods. And something you also wrote in this memoir that will not leave me, you said, Writing a letter is an act of love. It is a holy human moment. Well, I counted 23 of those holy human moments in your book, Kathy. Letters of varying shapes and sizes, each bookmarking life events past and present, 
as well as the artful inclusion of portraits and illustrations of floral plants you and Ruth both loved and shared. Could you describe your writing process as you crafted these letters? Did your letters change over the 11 months you wrote her and him? Thank you, Julie. That's a great question. You might be surprised to find this out because I type a lot, but these were handwritten. And so I sat at the kitchen table and wrote the letters to Ruth. Before I wrote them, I had to construct them because it was Ruth who had originally, she's a great <laughs> photographer and she would take these wonderful photographs of just everyday things. And then she'd have them process and glue them onto these cards. So I found online some stock cards that were blank and I pasted them on. Then I would write the Latin name and the common name. So I'd have that done first. And then I sat down at the kitchen table and started writing the letters. In the book, I say, you know, that I, I knew this was the greatest gift I could give Ruth. When she came in 2019, she brought the last gift she gave me, a uh, cornflower blue and gold leaf whole teapot because I collect oh, teapots. Nice. Yeah. It's a beautiful teapot. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about gifts. And she goes, you know, for me, it's always going to be letters. I think that was priceless. And I think about sitting at my kitchen table and writing these letters. It makes me think about the immediacy of our lives. Like, you know, what's going on right now? And so that's what I wrote. Um, I think Ruth thought of those as holy moments. Um, Thank you. And I had to that. Yes. Yeah, I do. I think that she, I honestly think about Ruth standing at her kitchen sink washing dishes and thinking that she had some kind of insider theological revelation washing the dishes. I think that Ruth knew for me that writing those letters was the same process as I wrote in my daily journal after our daughter was stillborn. And so I think that Ruth knew that writing saved my life because I wrote out the grief. I wrote out all the anger. But writing the letters to Ruth was an act of deep love because writing allowed me to let it go when Blue Week on a page. I um, can that, see that throughout the book, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. like it was my mm -hmm. way of, because I think that, I think experiencing grief is a holy moment. And I think that I say that Ruth thought of the death of our daughter as a holy moment. Like it's a death is, birth is, you know, that I think death is in particular because we face our own mortality. I was 24 when I had our daughter and that's a really young age to learn about mortality. And so I think that for me, I pretty much did the only thing I knew to do that would help Ruth, but also help me. You had known her for 40 years. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep. Yeah. All my adult life, pretty much. I was <laughs> really young when I met her. Thank goodness. The other thing you asked is if it changed. And I think, yes, I think the writing changed from the beginning to the end. Because in the beginning, uh, I was doing all the research too, Julie, to see like, what are the odds? What's the prognosis for a glioblastoma? And it got harder each month because I kept thinking, what do you write to someone who's dying? And what can I write to her that could bring her peace? What could I write to her that could comfort her? And the only thing I could think of is I'm just going to write, you know, how much I love her, how much she did for me to comfort me. I tried to like really think about what could give her a sense of stability. And, and a lot of times I would talk about like we would have a phone conversation or a Facebook conversation and I would follow up on those things so she would remember. So I kept writing and Todd, bless his heart, he kept reading it out loud for her because I don't think she had the vision to do it. Yeah, as I read the letters, they all encapsulated everyday life, which was very important to her and what was going on with you. So it was almost as if you were sitting across the table from her having a conversation in your kitchen. That's how it struck me. And it's so very and, accurate. And distracting <laughs> and distracting. You know, as someone like that, you hope that you can distract them from their pain and their discomfort, even if it's just for a minute during the day. It's worth it. And then finally, when they're leaving, it's the connection. I'm here with you. If you choose to go, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But I'm here with you until you choose. To, I'm here. I'm here. That type of feeling I got from your letter all the way through. Yes. That makes me so happy to know that. What pieces came together for you during your stay at Writer's Colony? The whole book came together at the Writer's Colony, to be honest. Okay. Um, and so I have to tell you this, is when I was an undergrad, I was introduced to Virginia Woolf. And you know, Virginia Woolf was right. A woman needs a room of her own, of one's own, to write. Because especially in her era, that whole idea that 
women didn't weren't writers, published writers, because they didn't have a room of their own. They didn't have the financial means. So to me, the writer's colony was a place where I could have a room of my own. And so I really did go there as the sole task to write the letter or write the book. I'm the kind of person that I write in spurts. I don't know. You must write like one of my friends. Uh, my former colleague in Nebraska, he wrote from 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. every day. Oh, he was wow. a pro prolific writer. And I'm like, I'm not that kind of writer. I need four or five days where I can write 10, 12 hours and get it all out. I'm always afraid I'm going to lose something. And so a lot of my writing process is that I write a lot of it in my head. So I did a lot of walking in Eureka Springs. Yes. Yeah. And so the writer's colony really gave me that space to really focus in on all these parts that were going on in my mind of not only writing the book, just the emotional space. I feel like I had to go somewhere neutral. I just think, I don't think I could have written it at home. There are just so many reminders of Ruth and I just needed a place to have that, that emotional space to really come to terms with things. And I think doing it at home, I don't think I would have had the same experience or I would have been distracted and I could never write it on campus because there's too many distractions, oh. <laughs> you know? Uh, in yeah, my, I, yeah. Yeah. I did choose something that is not part of the letters, but it's one of the special times with Ruth, the last time I was with Ruth. When we were in Tecumseh all those years ago, I missed my family so immensely. I thought my heart would burst in grief. I missed so much the times in the kitchen cooking or baking helping my mom, and even though I hated it at the time, I missed fighting with my older sister, Chris, about washing or drying the dishes. I miss those times of physical proximity, no matter the circumstances. I think Ruth understood this. I treasured the times I could be with her in her kitchen. In those first days in Tecumseh, we were young mothers and spouses, and one thing we did have a lot of time for was sitting down to visit over a cup of tea. We got to know each other well in the kitchen. We were there just to bake cookies, fry chicken, snap green beans, canned tomatoes, or preserved jams for our family's sustenance. We were building our lifelong friendship through the snippets of time available to us. We did this despite interruptions from our children and other distractions. It was also a time for me to learn from Ruth. She was an ex excellent cook and baker. Just like I observed and took mental notes when I was in the kitchen with my babsha, I was an eager apprentice of Ruth. We choreographed a kitchen dance from the outset of our relationship. I can probably draw from memory her kitchens in Tecumseh, Indianola, and Charles City. Ruth sat in her wheelchair in the doorway between the kitchen and the dining room as Rachel and I cooked. When I asked Ruth where she kept her paprika, she said, I don't use paprika and can't trust it. Ruth's sister Midge thought she didn't trust paprika because in her mind it was too closely associated with brown black pepper and Ruth notoriously hated pepper. Both Rachel and I posted about this experience on Facebook and I wrote the following. On Wednesday, Ruth's daughter Rachel came up from Des Moines, and we cooked. She and I made chicken tarragon, one of Ruth's favorites, a lovely French recipe. And although I have the recipe, I had never made it. Ruth supervised from her wheelchair as she sat in the kitchen. I've cooked in that kitchen with her many times, so it was pure joy to cook with Rachel and with Jerry as chief dish bottle washer. If you want to try these two recipes, I highly recommend them. If you make the chicken tarragon, Ruth's advice is to make a double batch of the sauce. I've posted photos of the recipe of the chicken tarragon that Ruth had handwritten, plus the photos of the recipe I had written of the zucchini chocolate cake where I wrote Ruth Yaten in the space from the kitchen of. Rachel's post about this day brought me to tears. Like her mother, her wisdom and insight about moments in time are key. When my mom was a nanny in college, the family she worked for was complicated. The wife rarely cooked, but when she did, it was extraordinary. She taught my mom how to make chicken tarragon, and it has always been a favorite of mine. About 10 years ago, I asked my mom to teach me how to make it. It's not hard, she told me, just a lot of steps. I dropped it because my boys were little, and I didn't have time for lots of steps. One of my biggest regrets when mom got sick was that we had never made the recipe together. I went to visit her today. Her best friend of 40-plus years was there, too. Mom asked that Kathy make chicken tarragon, so I became the sous chef, and we made the dish together. Mom wasn't able to help, but she sat in her wheelchair and tasted it to make sure it was just right. She made jokes and was just as much a part of the process as Kat and I were. Life is hard, so pick people to love you who will help your daughter cook your recipes when you can't. 
Before our cooking for that day, Jerry and I went to the fairway and high grocery grocery stores to procure the chicken, ground beef, and other greens for the chicken tarragon, meatloaf, and cake. Jerry has collected beer cans since he was a 12-year-old or younger, and so he couldn't resist buying beer. He chuckled when he saw a six-pack of Ruthie beer and bought some. I asked, do you think our Ruthie will have a Ruthie beer? Jerry shook his head and said, nope. But much to our surprise, she did have a few sips of beer while she watched Rachel and I cook. Ruth sipping a beer is one of the few times I recall her ever drinking any alcohol. One other time was Holy Week in the early 2000s. She and I met at the St. Benedict Center because I had an invitation to the Holy Thursday meal with the monks from across the road at Christ the King Priory, a special meal held at the Center for Friends of the Center in Oblates. Ruth was my plus one. The meal was delightful, and I recalled telling Ruth, wow, I can't believe they have wine. But the memorable thing about the trip to St. Benedict that year wasn't the Holy Thursday meal. It was the lunch the next day, Good Friday, with the monks at the Priory, a day of fasting for them. Father Thomas, the director of the retreat center, invited us to lunch because the kitchen staff at the center had the day off. We were the only two people in residence at the center, so we walked over for lunch, a simple meal of soup and bread. Ruth sat next to me, and I sat directly across from Father Gilmer, the prior for the community of Christ the King. The monks had a tradition of playing an audio tape during their lunch. The day's reading recited by a male with a monotone voice focused upon the text, Sirach 26, 7 through 12. A wicked wife is a chafing yoke. Taking hold of her is like grasping a scorpion. A drunken wife arouses great anger, for she does not hide her shame. By her haughty stare and her eyelids, an unchaste wife can be recognized. Keep a strict watch over an unruly wife, lest finding an opportunity she uses it. Watch out for her impudent eye, and do not be surprised if she betrays you. As a thirsty traveler opens his mouth and drinks from any water nearby, so she sits down before every tent peg and opens her quivers for every arrow. Both Ruth and I tried to stifle that while we were eating and listening to this recording. With all of our strength, we got through the meal. Father Germer across from me was stone-faced. He didn't even blink. But out of the corner of my eyes, I could see Father Thomas fidgeting. Once the meal was over, Ruth and I thanked the monks for their hospitality and generosity and for sharing their lunch with us. As soon as we opened the door and stepped outside, we burst into gales of laughter. We guffawed. Moments later, Father Thomas ran after us, clad in his flowing black habit and Birkenstocks. Kathy, Ruth, I'm so, so sorry about the luncheon recording. My apologies. We had no idea what the recording was going to be today. We were on a schedule. This made us laugh even more. But of course, Thomas came to us out of a concern for us as visitors. He was following the rule of St. Benedict and their belief in hospitality. Chapter 53 of the Rule of St. Benedict notes, All guests who present themselves are to be welcomed as Christ, for he himself will say, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Matthew 2, 25, 35 What made us howl with laughter was that quiver line. We thought we would burst into laughter in front of the monks. Of course, we both knew the monks immersed themselves in God's word daily, as that is the Benedictine way. For the rest of our day, we would allude to that very special Good Friday and laugh until we cried. I returned many times to the St. Benedict Center over the years. I discovered that Father German Newbert wasn't a stoic, emotionless, hard-nosed German. He was warm and kind and caring. In my heart, even though Good Friday was a solemn remembrance of Jesus' agony and death, I can't help but think if Jesus had been there with Ruth and me, he would have howled to him. I loved it. So, so, uh, well, I could just see both of you doing this. <laughs> I could just it was, see the laughter. Uh, we, wonderful. it was so funny. I mean, we, it was just, oh, so that's the quiver line. I, I, you can just see the two of us just like, <laughs> I did. I could see it. I could see it so very clearly. Well, Kathy, uh, Josh, where can we find your book? You can find it on Amazon. Just type in Dear Ruth by Kathy English. The ebook is now up on Barnes and Noble, and the print will be available soon on Barnes and Noble. Either that. And I always tell my students or anybody I know here locally if they want a copy, I have author copies. So, and you can also find a copy at the Writers Colony Library. Yes, that's right. Yes, you can. Yes. <laughs> Well, Kathy, it was so wonderful having you here today and hearing about your book and congratulations. Thank you so much, Julie. It was just a pleasure. Quite, it was an honor. And I, um, I, I love talking about the book and love, uh, especially love talking about Ruth. Especially. And thank you for listening in to the Right Now podcast. 
Upcoming events in February and March in Eureka Springs include the Crescent Hotel's Paranormal Weekend, as well as Mardi Gras and St. Patrick's Day festivity. Check out our website for upcoming Writers' Colony events, like author Sean Fitzgibbon's workshop on April 12th, How to Create, Launch, and Sell Graphic Novels and Graphic Nonfiction. Until next time, live your magic.